Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ryan Gavsky, and I'm the student president of the William F. Buckley Junior Program. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this afternoon's lecture on the Twitter files with Matt Taibbi. Before we begin the event, I'd like to say a few words about the Buckley Program and introduce our guest. The William F. Buckley Junior Program is the flagship program of the Buckley Institute, an organization dedicated to promoting intellectual diversity and open political discussion at Yale. We've hosted lectures, dinner seminars, firing line debates, and an annual conference each year since 2011. Our over 600 Buckley Fellows hold a wide range of political beliefs, but they all stand united against the formation of a liberal-only echo chamber on campus. By providing Yale students with a forum to engage meaningfully with serious conservative thought, the Buckley Program has become an institution on Yale's campus and a symbol for a more open and more representative political atmosphere. Especially at a university where the mission is the creation and cultivation of new knowledge, Buckley Fellows believe that all perspectives must be heard and examined in good faith. You can learn more about the program and how to become a fellow on our website at buckleyinstitute.com. Now for our guest. Matt Taibbi is the author of 11 books. Four of his books, including Griftopia, An Insane Clown President, are New York Times bestsellers. He is the publisher of the newsletter TK News and the co-host of the podcast Useful Idiots. He won a National Magazine Award for his writing for Rolling Stone and broke the news of the Twitter files in an investigative series. Please welcome Matt Taibbi. Hi, thank you all for uh, coming. Um, if th those of you who have phones may know that uh, about five minutes ago, we dropped two more Twitter files threads, so that's one of the reasons I was a little late getting here today. Uh, we were hectically trying to put that together, but um, so there should be some new news to talk about. Uh, so my name is Matt Taibbi. Um, I've been a reporter for three decades, and much of that time was spent in the former Soviet Union and then later at Rolling Stone magazine. Uh, I've written a number of books on subjects ranging from police brutality to presidential campaigning to the media and high finance, uh, a couple of books about the response to the 2008 financial crisis. Um, currently, I'm the editor of uh, an independent news site on Sub Substack, and um, lately have achieved, uh, I guess, significantly in increased renown or notoriety or infamy, I'm not sure what you would call it, uh, depending on your point of view, for having covered the Twitter files. And um, if you had told me even 10 years ago that I would someday be speaking to the William F. Buckley Institute uh, at Yale, <laughs> I would have asked you for uh, a hit of what you're smoking. Um, but you know what? I'm all for it. I'm really very glad to be here. And I'm so um, so glad and so honored that you, that you invited me to speak. Uh, I think in, in these uh, very interesting times, uh, there have been a lot of strange political bedfellows uh, that have been made, and we have to take advantage of those relationships. Thanks. Um, I grew up what you might call a classic ACLU liberal. Uh, my parents divorced when I was young, and in my teen years, my mother decided to uh, study for the bar which gave me the opportunity as a teenager to help her prepare for the LSATs. And in those years, I really fell in love with the core concepts of American law, the whole, the ideas of due process, the right to face one's accuser, the right to discovery, the right to trial of your peers, freedom of the press, all of those things. Um, and even at that age, you know, most of my heroes, I was already thinking about writing, so most of my heroes were writers, but one of them wasn't. Um, and the one who was not was Ira Glasser, who was the head of the ACLU. Uh, Ira was the longtime executive director there, and he was most famous um, for being the person who led the uh, defense of neo-Nazis to march in Skokie, Illinois. And we can come back to that decision in a moment. But um, one striking fact about uh, Mighty Ira, as he came to be called, was that um, his most famous political adversary was also a friend of his, uh, William F. Buckley. Um, 
and in a development that I think uh, foretold some odd curves to the arc of history, uh, Ira and Buckley eventually became close in a, in a very interesting way, uh, though they never really agreed politically about very much. Um, each was very committed to the larger concept of improving society through uh, honest intellectual debate and the generosity of, of spirit that's required when people who disagree decide to get to know one another. Um, when Mr. Buckley died, Ira wrote an article about their friendship that I uh, remember to this day and, and I always thought it was very touching and I want to quote a little bit from it here because I think it's relevant today. Uh, in this passage, uh, Glasser is talking about the issue of flag burning, which they debated uh, on Buckley show firing line. And so here's Ira talking. He said, we called it symbolic speech, the idea that the flag symbolized American constitutional freedoms, including the right to denounce it, superimpose it with doves, the then symbol of peace, or even burn it to communicate the notion that American ideals, ideals were going up in smoke. Others, including Buckley, disagreed and called it flag desecration, as if the flag literally was sacred and its use in such pro protests blasphemous. One of our firing line debates on that subject was on that subject. Near the end of the debate, frustrated, I thought, at the time, um, by the array of arguments against his position, Buckley played the majoritarian card. He said the, the Constitution may protect this expressive conduct, as you say, uh, but he told me the ordinary American just can't stomach the sight of someone burning an American flag and is entitled to, ha to pass laws banning it. At that juncture, uh, Glass Glasser said, I closed the debate by grinning and asserting that William F. Buckley, who was, he said, a scion of a wealthy family and had no contact with ordinary Americans, no idea what they thought or what they thought of it, He's, there's a bunch of insults in there. He, he goes on um, to essentially invite Buckley to lunch uh, at Nathan's in Coney Island uh, instead of the elegant and expensive Manhattan restaurants where he had taken me if he wanted to get a glimpse of ordinary Americans. And this is an important part, I think. Um, never one to shy away from a provocation or challenge, uh, especially on national television. He took me up on it, and a few, a few weeks later, off we went. Now, Glasser obviously played up the seeming comedy of taking William F. Buckley on the subway for a hot dog and a ball game, and there was maybe a little edge to those descriptions that was a little unnecessary, but the end result mattered, I think. Um, as he put it, to paraphrase what Humphrey Bogart said to Claude Rains in Casablanca, this was the beating of our beautiful friendship. He went on to talk about how the two, uh, friendship between the two had seemed out of question um, because they came from totally different backgrounds and argued about virtually every issue, often heatedly, often with sincere anger, um, and seemed to disagree just about everything. But one day, Glasser writes, I came across a column in which Buckley had described drug prohibition as a folly and a leading cause of preventable crime. He went on. Uh, never before having found an issue on which we agreed, I immediately wrote him, telling him that we might be equally surprised to know that the ACLU, which missed no opportunity to, to denounce and criticize, had taken that very same position for many years. I propose that we do something together to advance our common position. Uh, and he said that if we did, it might astonish our enemies and amaze our friends. And the passage ends with Buckley inviting Glasser to lunch, but not to Nathan's. Uh, and the strategy ends up working. You know, he says op opposition to drug prohibition, uh, which was mistakenly seen as a left-only issue, uh, became a kind of free spirit residue of youth, you know, culture of the 60s issue. It was liberated from that niche uh, understanding and broadened. And eventually, this became the first of a series of issues where there was some agreement um, between two sides that had been fundamentally opposed. Uh, today, you know, support for universal drug pro prohibition has significantly er eroded, um, in large part, I think, because these two people stayed true to their respective principles, but maintained enough intellectual respect 
to act together um, when they found an area of agreement. But the important part of the story for me was not so much that they found a political issue to agree about, um, but that each first had to show uh, a belief and a commitment to some basic enlightenment, enlightenment principles, like the idea uh, that honest debate and courageous intellectual exchange lead to progress. Um, in the Skokie episode, they diverged over how far one may carry that idea, but I think if both were here today, they'd probably be closer to agreement on that issue. We're in another moment where people who may be of opposite political persuasions um, might once again need to unite around a larger principle. Uh, the Trump years, I think, have brought around about a political sea change. Many of the people who claim to be committed to Ira Glass or liberals like myself have now gone over to a new, more Machiavellian, more pessimistic vision of politics that stresses the need to enhance and consolidate elite authority to stop populist contagion. In many ways, it's sort of the inverse of the 60s paradigm under which uh, Glasser and Buckley first met. Now, I've told the, um, the story of the Twitter file so many times now that I'll spare you the rote version of this, but just to sketch out the basics, I was invited, obviously, by the new ownership of Twitter to look through the internal files of a major American corporation. This never happens because of the unique uh, nature of these kinds of social media companies. Not only did we get a, um, a very intimate view into a very powerful company, but because Twitter itself reached into so many different places and touched so many people, we got to look at a lot of other things as well that was, I think, unique um, at least in the recent annals of journalism. Uh, and at first, you know, one of the first episodes was fairly limited in scope. They wanted me, well, actually, they didn't want me. I, we settled on the idea that um, we would look at the episode in which the New York Post expose about the Hunter Biden laptop story was throttled down by Twitter and by Facebook. My idea in looking at that story um, was not because I particularly cared so much about Hunter Biden or his laptop, but because I was interested in the question of whether or not the FBI or the DHS or any of those organizations had been in contact with um, a company like Twitter. And I thought this, if that if that relationship existed, that this would be where we might see it. Um, as it turned out, you know, that first batch of Twitter files didn't actually reveal that arrangement, um, but it did reveal a bunch of other things and it garnered a whole bunch of public interest and there was a, uh, a feel about it that was really interesting um, because uh, mainstream media for so long has been so uniform uh, in the way it presents issues really almost every product that you see uh, in, mainstream, in the mainstream press, CBS, NBC, ABC, the New York Times, Washington Post, the, the product is more or less identical. They're all really gunning for the same audience using the same techniques. And the idea of presenting uh, information that is different from somebody else's information is kind of an anathema to the way that this system of news works. And so the Twitter files, which were had intense public interest but went completely uncovered by all those news organizations, uh, they had the feel of something forbidden, uh, like Samizdat. I'm old enough to have gone to college in the Soviet Union, believe it or not, and I, I still remember uh, how people passed around, sort of hand copied, um, uh, you know, textbooks and uh, novels and other things like that, and this felt a little bit like that. It was released uh, in sort of guerrilla fashion and gained um, uh, traffic in the same way that Sami's Dot uh, materials did. But still, that first release really didn't um, tell us a whole lot, among other things, because we subsequently found out that the former uh, general counsel of the FBI was 
the deputy general counsel of Twitter and was helping sift through that initial batch. Once uh, he was removed from the company, the, the term that Elon Musk used was he was exited from the company, um, we got much fuller, broader access to all of these communications. And it was about a week into the project, we were looking at the, um, the issue of how Twitter came to decide to ban Donald Trump. Again, not because any of us particularly cared so much uh, about the partisan political angle on this, but because we were, thought there would be intense historical interests in how, how did they come to this decision. And this had been reported partially in places like the Washington Post, but we had a, uh, a method of looking through the Slack chats that would be uh, much more um, direct and it would be probably, we, we thought, very revealing. In the process of looking at um, all of the run-up to the decision of uh, to ban Donald Trump and to remove him from the platform, we had to look at a lot of communications involving content moderation decisions uh, in the run-up to the 2020 election. And we would see Slack chats. I started to see Slack chats that would say things like flagged by the FBI or forwarded by DHS. And um, I remember the first time that I saw one of those notations, uh, the first time I thought, I saw that, I thought, well, that's interesting. That's this, this is gonna be our big story for the entire uh, Twitter file. This is this one email where, where we get the word FBI on it. And then when I started to see it more and more and more, uh, then I started to have another thought, um, which was this project is temporary. Uh, as soon as we started to see the depth of the involvement of the security agencies, all of us knew that this was not gonna go on for very much longer, that sooner or later pressure would be brought to bear. Uh, at least that was our guess, we hoped not. But, uh, and we were told that the company was firmly behind the idea of um, continuing to release these files, and I think they were sincere about that. But we figured that sooner or later this would come to an end, so we started to prioritize getting as much information as we possibly could about the topics that we thought were most important um, so that we would have a chance to report something consequential before the door was closed. And just to recap quickly what some of those early decisions were, what some of those early reports ended up involving, I think the main, the, there were a couple of main things that uh, came out of the first month of reporting on the Twitter files, and I was joined by reporters like Barry Weiss, um, who is a longtime uh, reporter for the New York Times, now has her own uh, outfit on Substack as well. Michael Schellenberger, uh, who has his own um, independent site uh, called The Public. Uh, we were all independents. That was uh, actually a, an intentional decision by Musk, I think. He was trying to make a point in a number of directions. Number one, because he felt the corporate media was untrustworthy, uh, and number two, because he thought that the public wouldn't believe anything that was said if it came from the New York Times or Washington Post. So all of us were independents. Even though I have a lengthy history as a kind of mainstream credentialed reporter, I was sort of out of the tent, and that was one of the reasons that I, that, that I was chosen. So. There were a whole bunch of us in this room. The first thing that we found out, um, I think the, the first significant report had to do with uh, shadow banning, uh, what they call visibility filtering at Twitter. If you go back and look, you'll see in 2018, um, Twitter actually released a, a blog post. Uh, I, I think it was called Setting the Record Straight About Shadow Banning. And it said something along the lines of, people often ask, do we shadow ban? We do not. And that's how it starts. And then it goes on to kind of say in other words that yes, they do shadow ban, but they never actually use the term. Well, um, we found out pretty early on that 
not only do they shadow bend, but they have this unbelievably extensive um, toolbox that they can apply that basically gives this company and pretty much every other social media company the ability to amplify any individual voice all the way up to seen by everybody and all the way down to not seen by anybody, even by people who are searching uh, specifically for that name. They showed us pages where we could see um, bright notations that would say things like trends blacklist or search blacklist. So they actually had multiple different categories of uh, things that they actually called blacklists and we got pictures of that and put it on the internet. And remember before the Twitter files happened, there had never been open confirmation that this took place. Uh, everybody knew it took place, but um, this was the first time that you could actually see it and point to it. And uh, it was a, a really, I thought, a groundbreaking thing that Barry did. That was her report. Um, but the next thing after that, the thing that really took most of our attention for, the, for most of December and, and January was outlining the relationship of the federal government to, to Twitter. And we found out that they not only occasionally heard from bodies like the FBI or the DHS, um, but that it was a constant ongoing relationship, that there was a, a defined route of communication. Uh, it was essentially a two-lane highway. Uh, any moderation requests that came from any of the 50 states or from state governments, they went through the Department of Homeland Security, and anything that came from any federal government agency would pass through um, what the FBI called the belly button of the US government, which was themselves. So DHS handled the states, the belly button, the FBI handled the federal government requests, and all of those requests pass through a portal. They use the um, a, a thing called teleporter. And this was all managed by a special government department called the FITF, the Foreign In Influence Task Force, which has 80 agents detailed to it. Uh, believe it or not, these are people who are basically just scanning the web, looking for potential terms of uh, service violations. And it's comprised of people not just from the FBI and from DHS, but also from other agencies, uh, including the Office of Director of National Intelligence. So you have, you have state uh, enforcement, you have domestic homeland security uh, uh, law enforcement, you have the FBI, which is uh, counterintelligence and sort of federal policing, and then you had the intelligence services, which also had a hand in this. And not only was there this system that was established firmly by, uh, by uh, the election in 2020, there was also what they called a, a regular industry meeting. And we would see these amazing um, minutes uh, that were passed around. H here are the minutes for next week's industry meeting. And there would be an email, and it would have you know, 58 or you know, 70 respondents, and it would be from companies, the, the names in the list would be from companies like Pinterest and Google and Facebook and Wikipedia and then all kinds of strange, obscure, smaller tech companies, and they would all be regularly meeting uh, with not only the FBI and the DHS, but there would also, uh, more often than you'd expect, there would be a briefing by what they call OGA, which is other government agencies, which is a euphemism usually for intelligence services, very often the CIA. So uh, this was a regular thing. And this raised all, all kinds of questions, uh, not only about speech and about the First Amendment, but about antitrust issues. Uh, here were you know, this enormous group of companies that were apparently getting together and having secret covenants and codicils about speech and coming to agreements that the public didn't know about uh, with uh, intelligence agencies, enforcement agencies, and what did that mean exactly? Um, but it took a good two months to dig out through all these emails how this system worked and a lot 
lot of phone calls, a lot of confirmation. And we, um, when we finally felt solid about that, we started to look around for other issues. And it was then that we started to realize that this was a, uh, a problem that was bigger than a First Amendment issue. It was bigger than an antitrust issue. You know, the communications that Twitter was receiving, and just from the FBI, for instance, they would get spreadsheets full of um, account names with letters saying, we assess that the following are connected to Russia's internet research agency, and you may, according to your own sole discretion, decide that these are violations of your term of ser terms of service. Um, is that the government telling Twitter to take these accounts down? You know, technically, maybe not, I don't know, but when we looked to see what happened to, the, to those accounts, we found that a lot of them uh, very often were suspended right afterwards, that there's some kind of correlation to this activity. But not only were they getting these big batches of requests from the FBI, from uh, the Department of Homeland Security, from this agency that most of us had never heard of before called the Global Engagement Center. How many people have ever heard of the Global Engagement Center? Almost nobody, right? So this is a, um, a body that was created in Barack Obama's uh, last year. Uh, it's technically housed within the State Department, but it's not truly a State Department agency. It's a multi-agency task force that um, initially was founded with people from the Pentagon, from SOCOM, STRATCOM, DARPA. I mean, I talked to a bunch of these people, uh, and I'm very much sort of one of, the, one of these non-conspiratorial reporters. I hate conspiracy theories, but you start to see these emails, and it has all of these agencies represented, and the GEC starts to appear everywhere in, these, um, in communications with Twitter. And they're sending reports about all the multiple varieties of, of groups that they considered foreign threat actors. But a, apart from that, apart from the direct communications they were getting, not just from the FBI and DHS and G GEC and all these other agencies, HHS, Treasury, um, the, you know, the Department of Transportation in one case. Uh, there were also there was also this huge galaxy of other organizations uh, that called themselves anti disinformation uh, outlets, and these basically were quasi private or quasi public uh, organizations that were also basically in the lists in the business of making lists of people they considered to be too offensive to be um, represented on the internet. There, the, there was a center called the Center for Countering Digital Hate. Um, they were very, very aggressive, and they, uh, for instance, compiled a list of people they called the Disinformation Dozen uh, about COVID. And they sent their list to all 50 attorneys general, um, and then to Twitter, and then they would send these lists to the news media. And we started to see this pattern where Civil society organizations, the news media, tech companies, and enforcement agencies were all basically communicating and on the same page about this movement to, um, to censor and modify speech. If uh, one of these centers didn't have luck the first time getting Twitter to take a, an account down, they would send their list to the Washington Post or the Financial Times or the New York Times. The newspaper would then call up Twitter. Twitter would then know. They were on notice that they had 24 or 48 hours to take down these accounts or they would have negative press about how they weren't doing enough to stop you know, whether it was Russian interference or COVID misinformation or whatever it was. Uh, but if they still didn't act, these centers would sometimes forward their lists on to an enforcement agency like the FBI. And the FBI would send that same list on to Twitter, at which point, usually they got the message and eventually these accounts came down. 
Um, now, why does this matter? Because I think it represented a new style of politics, and this is uh, the, at the point of the story where I, I started to think that um, uh, these stories were gonna be harder to explain to ordinary audiences than just, well, the FBI is talking to Twitter or Twitter blocked you know, the Hunter Biden laptop story and why did they do that? This was a bigger conceptual story about a kind of a sea change in how um, powerful institutions viewed uh, politics and their relationship to each other and to the public. Um, this was, I think, tr triggered by, you know, sort of the relationship, uh, the rise of Donald Trump, and it, who I think birthed a new brand of paranoid politics in response, where these once liberalizing institutions like the press and the NGOs uh, stopped acting as checks against each other and were encouraged to absorb into a larger whole, creating a single kind of cartel-like um, organization uh, to act against the contagion of mass movements. Uh, one of my um, colleagues, one of the people who writes for my site, Andrew Lowenthal, he used to work for a civil society organization called Engage Media, and he made the very interesting observation as he was going through the Twitter files that there were constant references to speech and political ideas using the terminology of disease. So you would often read about things like infodemics or information pollution or contagion or information disorder because uh, increasingly these groups saw themselves as the pure whole surrounded by the contagion of populist movements or anti-democratic uh, governments abroad or, or foreign interference or anti-vaxxers or whatever it was. It was the, the group inside, inside the tent, surrounded uh, by a, a whole series of outgroups who had to be de-amplified. Um, and surrounded by the disease of political, of these dangerous political ideas, uh, they discarded the old adversarial idea in favor of banding together. And uh, there's a reporter for The Guardian named Luke Harding, uh, who, he's an interesting character in himself, but he laid out this idea very explicitly a few years ago in a review of a book about Bellingcat, which is, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's kind of the establishment facsimile for WikiLeaks. It's a leak site, but what they do is they leak permitted things um, to further a narrative that the government likes as opposed to one that they're horrified by, which is what WikiLeaks was all about. And here is a passage that, um, that Harding wrote about Bellingcat and Elliot Higgins, its founder. Higgins, he wrote, thinks traditional news outlets need to establish their own open source investigation teams or miss out. He's right. Several have done so. The New York Times has recruited ex Bellingcat staff. Higgins approves of this. In his view, rivalry between media titles is a thing of the past. The future is collaboration, the hunt for evidence, a shared endeavor, the truth out there if we wish to discover it. Now, he makes it sound very cheery, but the rivalry of media titles uh, is the primary, if not only, regulatory mechanism in, in the news media. Um, without uh, news organizations keeping each other honest, uh, you know, titles like the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, and MSNBC, they no longer have any incentive to correct errors. So things like the Hamilton 68 fiasco, which we reported on the Twitter files, or some of the Trump Russia stories, or Bounty Gate, or even the stuff about Hunter Biden laptop, you don't have to correct them if none of the people in the cartel decide to think on each other. If, they, if you never have to face your critics, you can just embrace a mistake endlessly. Uh, and that was something that was not true even 10 years ago. Uh, what else does this shared endeavor look like? Um, well, for instance, with uh, they can change their minds about what they see is true or what has always been true um, at the drop of a hat. Uh, for instance, there, yeah, I was very shocked when I looked at emails from 
Stanford's Virality Project, which was uh, this big uh, organization that was dedicated to policing misinformation about the pandemic. And they had sent a letter to Twitter uh, suggesting that you, know, you should consider as standard misinformation on your platform uh, tr stories of true vaccine side effects or true stories that may pr promote hesitancy. Uh, because their concept was, even if a story is true, if the idea behind it is to encourage people not to get the vaccine, well then we don't want that. So it's politically untrue, um, even if it's technically or factually true. So they probably felt that pretty, pretty honestly for a while, but um, they can decide in the drop of a hat that what they thought yesterday is no longer true. So we just two days ago saw an NBC News report titled, Possible Links Between COVID Shots and Tinnitus Emerge. Now, previously it might have been thought that a story like that would, would be considered disinformation or misinformation or malinformation, which is their euphemism for things that are true but inconvenient. And that would have been dialed down or deamplified. But now, suddenly, it seems that even like sort of big corporate media has decided that they're allowed to report on these things. And what does that mean? And it puts people, you know, from the point of view of a media consumer, as somebody who's been in the media for a long time, yeah, I think of how the audience looks at this. And to me, they're now looking at the news the same way that um, the Soviets that I knew when I was a student looked at Soviet media. They're reading between the lines. They're trying to figure out what these messages mean. Why, why was it not OK yesterday to talk about this, but it is OK today? Um, does that mean they've discovered a new danger? Um, is this danger more real than the previous one? It's very unsettling for people uh, to not be in on what the discussion is. And that's really what uh, this thing that we ended up calling the censorship industrial complex is about. It's about creating a two-tiered uh, system where there are a group of institutions that should be um, sort of policing each other, but instead they've banded together and they have become the gatekeepers for information. They're, telling, they're deciding collectively uh, in secret what gets to be seen more and what, what's gonna be seen less. And um, they're amassing an ever-increasing amount of outgroups who are just not privy to the real information. And, you know, why is this important? You know, I think in a democracy, uh, you need to have what um, a co one colleague of mine calls dynamic tension between all these liberalizing institutions in order for, that, for democracy to work. The media has to act as a check on government. Government has to be separate from industry. Uh, industry has to be separate from civil society institutions. Civil society institutions can't be meeting too much with uncivil institutions. Uh, it was a big shock for um, you know, my, my colleague Andrew Lowenthal, having worked at a civil society institution, to see that there were NGOs that five years ago would have called themselves civil society institutions, meeting for election tabletop exercises with people from the Pentagon and the West Point. And West Point. Um, you know, as he put it to me, civil, means, civil society means not the military. Um, they're not supposed to be meeting with one another. Another example of this is, you know, we found an email that we just put out today where a bunch of journalists, very high ranking, high profile journalists attended another tabletop exercise in the summer of 2020 that foretold uh, a story about the leak of information, uh, a hack and leak uh, in, uh, operation involving Hunter Biden and Burisma. And a few weeks later, or I think it was a month later, that story actually happened. Now as a journalist, the minute that story actually happens, the existence of that tabletop exercise becomes news, and you have to find a way to report it. Um, now, I, when I reached out to all these reporters, who included people from the New York Times, even the editor of my old magazine, Rolling Stone, was there. 
why didn't you write about this tabletop exercise? They didn't answer. You know, the, the answer probably was because we've, we've seen a lot of these uh, conferences where, where the reporters granted off the record privileges to the participants. And probably it was off the record, but what does that mean? Why are journalists going to these, um, to these conferences full of military and uh, law enforcement uh, people and giving them off the record privileges over and over again unless they see themselves and really not as journalists anymore but more as participants and I think that's what's happening. So, you know, democracy really requires that tension uh, between all of these groups, but these groups don't see themselves as having any kind of separateness anymore. They're interchangeable. They move back and forth between each other's worlds effortlessly. There are CIA agents who move straight from Langley to Twitter. Twitter people go straight from Twitter to NGOs. The NGO people go uh, straight from there back to Langley. Then there are FBI agents who go to work for MSNBC. And it's all one big club, and they all hang out with each, with each other. And um, it's very much like the model of the old military industrial complex, which is why uh, my colleague Michael Schellenberger gave it that name. But I don't think this model works. Um, I think uh, you, you know, there was appropriate tension between people like Ira Glasser and, and William F. Buckley. They saw themselves as having different ideas but the same principle. Um, uh, and they were citizens who maintained separateness but a commitment to a larger good. And here, what we're seeing is the opposite. We're seeing um, this idea where a group of people are insisting on uh, homogeneity, uh, a homogenous political concept where everybody is sort of on board about what the boundaries of acceptable thought are, and they're um, increasingly leaving everybody else out of the tent. And I think, you know, the, the Glasser, uh, Buckley story had a happy ending, but if something isn't done about this concentration of power, this quote unquote shared endeavor, um, this generation's version of the same thing uh, won't have a happy ending. Um, anyway, thank you so much for, for paying, uh, being here today, and I'm sorry I'm disorganized uh, because of the reports that came out today, but I'm, I'd be, love to answer any questions that you have. This work? Oh, perfect. So we have time for a few questions. Would anyone like to get us started? Do you have a question? Or Matt, uh, your perspective uh, is fascinating, having been inside and uh, sort of outside the tent. And weren't you involved in a, the debate in Canada? <laughs> uh, uh, debates, yeah. Yeah, uh, about the objectivity of U.S. press. And uh, I'm interested in any. Uh, personal experiences you may have had uh, that, that shed light on how the press has transformed into what you're describing now. And also, by the way, a side effect, love your dad, street smart oh. reporting, <laughs> and I'm sure he's proud as heck of you. Thank you so much. Yeah, you know, my, my, my father was a television reporter. Uh, were you, are you Canadian? Excellent. Um, well, one funny thing about that debate, thank you for the question, is that uh, it was the night before that I found out about the, the Twitter files opportunity. Um, you may not remember this, but there was a question about them during the debate, which I let the other, uh, uh, my co-debater Douglas Murray answer, because I didn't want to give away uh, what was happening. Um, but the, yeah, there's been a huge sea change in the media. It, Again, the news media used to sort of fiercely insist on itself as a separate institution. If one of us got in trouble, we all kind of rallied, you know, in defense of the other. I mean, something that, like that happened to me recently where I was threatened with jail. You would never see nobody in media saying something about that. But the incident um, that sticks out in my mind was 
in March of uh, 2017. I remember watching Congressman Adam Schiff uh, read out his version of the Steele dossier uh, in this very uh, publicized hearing on Russian active measures. And I had a thought to myself, though, this must be true because there's no such thing as prepared congressional remarks that haven't been fact-checked. Like, that, that would never happen. And we even had a rule at Rolling Stone that if, it was, if something was in a prepared remark that you could use that as a way to check a fact. Um, but I wrote to uh, the Schiff's office and I said, hey, did you check any of this stuff? Because there were all these wild you know, assertions in there about bribes and you know, the FSB and all this stuff. And he said, um, the, the answer came back, we look forward to speaking to Mr. Steele as, as soon as possible to corroborate or refute these allegations. So they hadn't checked it before they went on national television and read all this stuff. And I remember talking to some other reporters um, who were in Washington and saying, this is crazy. Like, how are we going to do the job if you know, this is the new way of looking at things? And the general perception was that in the context of fighting against Donald Trump, this kind of thing was permitted. This was going to be allowed from now on. And you know, I'm not a fan of Donald Trump. I wrote a book about the guy called Insane Clown President. Um, but you can't just throw those standards out the window and expect that it's not going to come back at you eventually. And that, I think that's what's happened to the business, is that they've, they've lost their way. That was our way of grounding ourselves, uh, making sure that we didn't get in trouble. And you know, now, now we're in a different place. They politicized it. Would you like to yeah, yeah. go ahead? Hello. Um, I'll just take this out. Uh, my name is Zach. I'm an 18-year-old senior. Um, Hi, Zach. And I will say that one thing that we could ag can agree on is that the interplay of ideas is important, no matter um, what our political positions are. Um, that being said, uh, in 2019, Donald Trump was president, and there were some recent reports that said that the Trump administration officials asked Twitter to take down some insulting tweets. So by, by your logic, wouldn't that constitute a conservative effort to use the government to suppress free speech? Yeah, I mean, we found all sorts of people asking, making, um, thanks for the question. We found all sorts of people who were making efforts to try to get this person or that person taken off the platform. And I reported in the first uh, Twitter files thread that both the Trump administration and, uh, and the Biden campaign had both made um, requests and had them honored. We just didn't have a lot of examples of that, but more, more importantly, I didn't feel like those individual requests were anywhere near as important as the institutional reality. Uh, people come and go, individuals, um, you know, may do stupid things, uh, but none of what we were saying was really about the left or the right. This was about the institutional structure of FBI, DHS, ODNI, CIA, having this relationship. It could go against the right today. It could go against the left tomorrow. We just put out something today about, you know, Twitter had an algorithm that put Dr. Jill Stein in a bucket called is underscore Russian. Um, so these tools, they, it, it's not about it's not about conservatives and, and uh, liberals, or it's very specifically not about Democrats and Republicans. It's really about insiders and outsiders. And um, I think one of the things that has been frustrating for me is that people have tried to cast this as, um, you know, as a partisan series of reports. When actually, if you read it, there's maybe a couple that that um, you know are the right is enthusiastic about, but mostly it's more about this institutional story. A few weeks ago, I saw you and Michael Schellenberger testifying before Congress. I wondered how that turned out and if there's any follow-up or what do you expect to come of it? Um, so I don't know if you heard, but the... Um, so I, I made a, a factual error in a tweet, um, actually two. 
One is that I, mit, I, mit, I wrote CISA when I meant CIS, and I got a date wrong in another one. And um, this turned into a tweet from an MSNBC host who in turn was picked up by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and then members of that committee that um, questioned us that day. And they're, they're threatening me with uh, perjury charges and five years in prison um, over the acronym. Uh, and the kind of amazing thing about that is that in the process of making that accusation, the, the specific accusation is, is that um, the agency CISA that I wrote, they were saying that CISA does not work with this thing called the Election Integrity Partnership that, that Stanford had maintained. Actually, they're openly partners. Everybody's, uh, they have, they've all announced it on their websites. They, you, know, you can see um, press releases about it. The problem was that I just misread in a screenshot CIS. I thought it was a typo and added an A, but that doesn't change the fundamental reality of it. But again, um, so there, there's an error they're making, but they're, they're threatening you know, me with jail over this, which uh, in addition to the fact that um, I had a visit from an IRS agent to my house the day that we were testifying about this stuff, and I, I don't know the government any money, and they, one of the issues that they raised was something about an electronic return from 2018 having been rejected uh, because of fears of identity theft, and I had never heard this before. So there's all kinds of weird stuff, but the, the really chilling thing about this is that there is this underlying, I knew when we did these reports that there was going to be a negative reaction from news media that you know, the quote unquote old mainstream media that I, that I used to work in for so long that they would ignore it and all that. But there's this kind of like withering hatred that's out there now in society, in society that is, um, it's kind of a mystery to me. Like people get worked up to the point of, I think sincerely wanting to put people away forever in jail over political disputes and you know, I grew up in like the Wayne's World version of America where people got high and played street hockey and didn't really care whatever, what people next door did. And, you know, there's this hatred about you know, people, you know, us showing a few emails um, that is very strange. And I think it's, it's a cult-like behavior, you know? And, and uh, I think we gotta get to the bottom of that before it gets, it gets really weird. Um, uh, and we're getting pretty close to that, I think. Hello. Um, first off, thank you for being willing to share your ideas with us today. My name is Xavian. Um, first off, I agree with you entirely that the government should not have involvement in policing ideas or opinions especially. Um, but I was curious to ask if you think there's any degree of intervention or um, censorship that is ever justified either from a government entity or from private social media platforms. I know recently we had some national security concerns um, with an information leak on the platform Discord, and in terms of honest reporting or misinformation, um, we recently had Fox News settle with the Dominion voting systems for misleading reports on the 2020 election. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts. Do you think intervention in any of those cases, federal or private, is justified? Sure, that's a great question, and I'm really happy to answer that because uh, one of the things that's been tossed around a lot is that, oh, these people who are doing these stories, they're free speech absolutists. They, they will not brook um, any kind of curbing of any kind of speech, which is totally ridiculous. Any journalist who's worked in the news media, um, you know, as I have for now more than three decades, you, you're always negotiating a large number of restrictions to get anything into print. You have to worry about libel, slander, libel per se. Um, you know, you're, you're worried about whether you're disclosing national secrets. Um, you're worried if you're even going to get a, the thing that you're printing is going to um, result in a frivolous lawsuit, which will tie up your 
your organization, you have to get it right. Um, I think that that's something that's very different from social media. Social media has a, a very high tolerance for libel as opposed to the old uh, news media uh, version, which was based on litigation and where it, usually it started with an injured party and they would go to um, go to the court system. But you, you referenced the Dominion case. That's an example of how the old system works. Uh, when you have a company that has a, a, a claim against somebody who's made an inaccurate claim in the news media that's harmed their reputation and materially damaged their business or you know, maybe their marriage or something like that, it's entirely appropriate for, for that to be limited. That's why um, we have all these laws, and, and there's a lot of them. Um, and you get acquainted with that when you work in the business. We just haven't updated that system accurately for the internet. The internet is a new phenomenon where we're not just looking at the publications from the New York Times and NBC and looking at that, we're also looking at the sort of the private conversations of ordinary citizens, which can sometimes go viral. Well, what do we do about that? Do we have, do we apply the same standards for that? Can those people be litigated against? Um, I think, I, I agree that we need to come up with something, um, but what they're doing is, uh, is they're going many steps beyond a, a rational response to that problem. And the, the major thing that I worry about is that they're, you know, rather than dealing with the kind of open litigation system that we had before, and we had a very high bar for prohibiting speech intentionally in the states, rather than dealing with that, they want to start with a, a new system where there's, there's no kind of process, there's no transparency. You don't even have to be notified if you're, um, if you're taken off the web or deamplified or anything like that. We can't have that. I think we have to, we have, to have something that, um, that respects speech and, and is in the spirit of the First Amendment, uh, but is also you know, respectful of audiences and, and, and you know, protects against true harm. But you can really very easily overdefine harm. And that's, that's where I think what we've seen in the Twitter files is, is repeatedly the problem, is a bunch of people getting together and by themselves deciding what harm is or what a threat is. And that's not good enough, I don't think. I think we have time for one last question. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for coming. Um, so your speech, you talked a lot about uh, Twitter, which is obviously um, an American-owned company. Uh, however, in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of concern about um, TikTok and um, potential uh, threats from China. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about the censorship of TikTok, particularly um, concerning like its servers and ownership. Yeah, thank you. That's a really good question. Um, you know, it, in the process of working on this story, I've had uh, a unique, unique experience of speaking with a lot of people from the intelligence world, which is sort of a new thing for me. I, it's, I've, I haven't spent a lot of time in that beat. Um, I covered finance. I covered the criminal justice system. Never this, really. And a lot of what they're saying is that what we're seeing now is come to head is a long simmering argument over how much, how many information operations we're going to tolerate. Um, you know, we've been doing this kind of thing, what, what they call offensive inf information operations. All the major powers of the world have been doing it to each other since World War II. It's just with the advent of the internet and social media, it's gotten much, much easier. They're creating fake accounts. We do it. That's one of the things that we found out in the, in the Twitter files. We, you know, the Pentagon and CENTCOM creates fake accounts. Why do they do that? Because if there's a drone attack in a village, well, we want to have local Arab language accounts that say there weren't that many casualties. That kind of stuff happens. But it also, you know, Russia does it, China does it, Iran does it. Um, so what do you do about that? Uh, you know, uh, for the same reasons that China's nervous about having Google and 
uh, in China, um, we, I think justifiably, there, there's some justifiable concern about platforms like TikTok where, you know, there's, there's a threat that there might be some Chinese propaganda, but the response to it that, I, that, that we have now that is the proposed solution, the Restrict Act, um, you know, that's like the Patriot Act on steroids. It's, it's, a, it's an overcompensation. It, it, allow, it again allows a group of people who are unregulated to make subjective determinations about what is or is not a threat to national security. And from there, they can basically just step in and shut anything, not, not just TikTok down. And um, I worry about that. You know, I, I, the, there, there's a fine line that has to be walked here, um, you know, between allowing these things. I mean, I, I think once upon a time, we weren't afraid of Russian propaganda or Chinese propaganda. America had a strong enough society that, you know, they could put out their, you know, newspapers and we, we even allowed it to happen and we weren't scared of it. Um, I, I wonder if that threat is overblown, frankly. But, but certainly, I, if there's going to be a solution, we can't have it be this um, sort of nuclear-powered, uh, federal, let's give us the authority to go in anywhere and just wipe it all out if we, if we feel threatened. Um, I think that's, we've seen that, that kind of thing be abused already, and I worry about that. Well, that's all the time we have for today, but I hope you'll all join me in thanking Mr. Chaibi for being with us this afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you.